I'm really excited to be bringing the message that's in this video. I feel like I've waited for such a long time to be able to share the things that God has been showing me. Um, stick with me uh, until the second half of this video because it starts to get really interesting after that. Um, but um, I'm hoping that the, the message is bringing hope to you um, because we've entered um, very hard times now and it's only going to get harder. It's not going to, to get better and that's what the Bible told us was going to happen. But um, there are many good people of God floundering at the moment, not understanding why they're outside of a church community, not understanding why they're in a wilderness situation. And in many cases, they're feeling quite disconnected from others. Um, I believe I can shed some light on this and hopefully bring some peace to you. And I'm going to start by sharing a dream that I had in March 2013. Now in this dream, um, I was the observer and um, I was in an auditorium watching a Christian conference take place. And the leaders were up on the stage and they were doing what leaders do at a conference. They were teaching and preaching and telling the people, you know, this is the way to go. And, um, uh, and after a little while, there was a break, like a lunch break. And a woman got up from the audience and she walked out and uh, the leaders pursued her. And uh, when they caught up with her, they're saying, now, you should be doing this and you should be doing this and that and this and this. You should be doing all these things. And the woman said to them, look, if I do the things that you're telling me to do, this is what the end result will be. And with that, she pulled down the top of her dress and showed her bare breasts. Well, the leaders were a little bit shocked, but then their faces started to glaze over. It was like they wanted to ignore what they were seeing. And then um, the leaders went back into the auditorium, went back up on the stage and continued to teach and preach and do all that thing. And the inference was that the leaders were doing the same old, same old. They were teaching the same old, same old. Now, that's the end of that part of the dream. There is a little bit more, and I'll share that. But first, I want to um, just give the interpretation of that bit there. Now, the woman who left the auditorium was wearing a white dress with black spots. Now, she represents the bride. The she, the white dress is her garment, the black spots means that she's still not spotless. She, there's, you know, she's been tainted and she's been tainted by her relationship with the institutionalized church. What they've been teaching has, um, has defiled her. So um, when the leaders caught up to her and they're telling her, you should be doing all this and this and this and this, and she said, look, if I do what you tell me to do, this is the end result. And she pulled the top of the dress down, showing her bare breasts. What she was saying was, if I do what you tell me to do, I'm going to become the harlot. And they didn't want to hear that, right? They, do, they would totally ignore it. Now, this is what's been taking place. A lot of good people have been trying to tell leadership that maybe you're going down the wrong path. Maybe you aren't teaching exactly what the gospel means. You know, maybe there's some deception coming in, but they're not interested. They won't listen. They absolutely refuse to listen, and they're just getting back up in front of the people and teaching the same old, same old. They're not helping the people get prepared for what's coming. They are not helping the people become the bride. The woman represents those that God has pulled out of the institutionalized church and now find themselves in a wilderness experience, um, these are the ones that God sees potentially to become the bride. But he has to pull them out to get rid of those spots that are still there. He has to um, take them out of that environment where they're being exposed to deception and 
to false teaching and false pro prophetic messages and and he needs to isolate her really to cut her off from other voices at the moment so that she'll concentrate on what he's saying to them and a, a lot of people who found themselves in the wilderness experience um, haven't really understood why they're there, why they're in that place. Um, they may have even felt like God had rejected them and abandoned them, and it can definitely feel like that. But um, actually it's contrary. Um, God has been watching your heart and has determined that you have, as I said, potential to become the bride. Um, but you have to be listening to what he's saying. You have to be listening and um, allowing him to remove the old ways of thinking that have come from being exposed to the assumptions and the deceptions um, of man-made uh, doctrines. So um, he has um, a, a lot of people in the wilderness um, and trying to prepare them um, to be the new wineskins. Now that was the end of the visual part of the dream. The dream went on for a little bit. I didn't get any more pictures, but God spoke to me. I, I heard his voice and he said to me, right now I am separating the sheep from the goats amongst my people. Do nothing but worship. And that was the end of the complete end of the dream. And uh, that's what I've been doing. I mean, uh, I'm always in that place of worship, but since then, um, God has been speaking to me from that place and showing me some revelations. And, and, and now it's obviously time to share that. Um, it was interesting because immediately following that dream, the week following that dream, God showed me very um, conclusively and left me without any doubt that one of the issues um, that would be very defining in separating the sheep from the goats amongst uh, Christians was the issue of homosexuality. Now, the dream was in 2013, um, so I didn't know what was going to be coming up, but in 2015, um, the US voted for same-sex marriage, and um, it really um, exploded onto the Christian um, uh, community, and it's really caused a, a very deep divide um, amongst Christians, there are those that are, you know, very, um, you know, they're taking a really hard line, a hard stand against homosexuality. And then there's this other side that, um, you know, very strongly want to support um, homosexuality. And, um, and so you've seen this really, really strong divide. And it's been very interesting to see it play out. Um, like God showed me that it was was going to. Now, you may be tempted to believe that if you don't take a stand against homosexuality, you know, according to God's own laws, that God will put you into the goat group. But that's exactly the opposite of what God showed me. This has never, ever been about whether homosexuality is a sin or not. What God is looking for is how is his people treating the gay community? How are they treating the unsaved? Because how we treat them reveals two things about us. First, it reveals the condition of our heart. Do we have empathy? Are we trying to understand their situation? Do we have compassion? Are we being open-hearted and inclusive? Are we reflecting the Father's heart to them? Or are we rejecting them, condemning them, being exclusive and isolating, name-calling, criticising and dehumanising them? And are we making God a roadblock for them? 
And why is that? Well, it's because so many Christians are looking to the prosperity gospel and not to the truth, which is that we are to surrender every day to the transform transforming work of the refiner's fire. I mean, you have to ask yourself, are you willing to pay that price? Now, the bride is going to be without spot or wrinkle, not because God will wave a magic wand over and she'll suddenly become clean, but because she has chosen to make herself ready. She'll be willing to pay that price. It's what's going to make her stand out. The 144,000 are also found without fault before the throne. Now, is that a coincidence or are they the same people group? Now, I'm going to offer proof to say that they are one in the same. So now we're going to look at who the 144,000 are because they're the, the ones that will be bearing the new wine. They're also the ones that are going to deliver the gospel the final time to the world. Measuring the temple. God is looking for vessels into which he can pour the new wine. Now, Ezekiel, Zechariah, and John all had visions where the temple was being measured. So in Ezekiel 40, 4 to 5, it says, And the man said to me, Son of man, look with your eyes and hear with your ears and fix your mind on everything I show you. For you were brought here so that I might show them to you. Declare to the house of Israel everything you see. Now there was a wall all around the outside of the temple. In the man's hand was a measuring rod six cubits long, each being a cubit and a handbreadth. And he measured the width of the wall structure, one rod, and the height, one rod. In Zechariah 2, 1 to 2, it says, Then I raised my eyes and looked, and behold, a man with a measuring line in his hand. So I said, Where are you going? And he said to me, to measure Jerusalem, to see what is its width and what is its length. And in Revelations 11, 1 to 2, it says, Then I was given a reed like a measuring rod, and the angel stood, saying, Rise and measure the temple of God, the altar, and those who worship there. But leave out the court, which is outside the temple, and do not measure it, for it is being given to the Gentiles. So John was to measure the temple, the altar, and the people. Now, what is the temple? Well, we are the temple of God, and the Spirit of God dwells within us. Throughout the Gospels, Jesus referred to himself as the temple because the Holy Spirit dwelt within him. But after Pentecost, those that received the Holy Spirit are referred to as the temple, for the Holy Spirit dwells within their temple. Now the altar, the altar is the place where the New Testament priesthood offer up their lives as living sacrifices. And then the people who worship there, well these people are in the holy place. They are not in the outer court. God specifically told John not to measure the outer court. Now in a previous video we looked at the outer court. That was where the lowest levels of priests ministered. These, uh, those priests were not required to be set apart or holy. They were not required to be direct descendants of the tribe of Levi. They ministered only in the outer court and were not allowed to go into the holiest place of the, of the temple because they were not consecrated. They were considered unclean and would defile the temple because they handled dead things. They handled the sacrifices. In Jesus' times, uh, Gentiles were also allowed to enter into uh, the outer court area as well. Now, um, these priests and the Gentiles who entered the outer court, as I said, were not allowed to enter the holiest places in the temple. If they did, it actually carried a death penalty. Now, the outer court had no covering. There was no roof over the area of the temple, and this is going to be important uh, possibly in the next video when I talk about the timing of the bride, when the bride is going to um, emerge. Okay, so those who are in the outer court are later identified in the book of Revelation as the great multitude 
Once again, I'll tackle that in another video as well. The priesthood who ministered in the holy place, on the other hand, had to prove their lineage from the tribe of Levi. They had to be descendants of Aaron. Now they were consecrated and set apart for service to God. They were to remain clean. They were to remain holy, undefiled. They were not to touch any unclean thing. They taught the people about holiness and the laws of God. But their first priority was to minister to the Lord in the holy place offering up incense on the altar and standing to worship before the Lord. These are identified in the book of Revelation as the 144,000. Now this is the highest purpose of the 144,000. As a royal priesthood, their first priority is to minister to the Lord, to worship and sacrifice their lives on the altar just as Christ did. They are to offer their lives as a sweet-smelling sacrifice. The 144,000 are holy. They are spotless and without blame. The Bible refers to them as virgins. But here's the thing. No one is without sin. No one. The 144,000 are not found without fault before the throne of God because they have never sinned. To believe that is to not understand the gospel. We are all born under the curse. We are all born of Adam's DNA. These verses in Revelation 4, 14 clearly state twice that the 144,000 have been redeemed. To be redeemed means to be set free from the consequences of their sin. It doesn't mean to be born sinless. They are not virgins because they have never engaged in sexual relations. They are spiritual virgins who have not engaged in idolatry. God is their only love. The fact that they have been fully redeemed is what makes them so special. Um, is because they are going to be perfect witnesses to the redemptive power of God. They are going to stand out from ordinary people, from ordinary Christians, because of their selfless act of surrendering to the refiner's fire. They will be known for the co cost that they have paid solely because of their love for their Saviour. A true witness for the kingdom is one who can display the evidence through their own lives of the redemptive power of God. Too many Christians believe that evangelizing is done with the mouth, but it is lived by your life, as I said earlier. And there are far too many hypocrites who say the words but cannot produce through their life the evidence. The measuring of the temples was specifically for the holiest parts of the temple. And if we are the temple, then it is the people that are being measured. God wants to see if these people measure up to his standard. They are being judged. If they hold up to his standard of holiness, then they will be sealed. So just to reiterate, God's elect his remnant, those that he seals, protects and delivers out of the tribulation period, the overcomers, Smyrna and Philadelphia, and those that join them from the other five churches that are able to overcome their faults and leave the ways of the apostate church behind, those that come out of Babylon, the scarlet woman, to get out from under the mark of the beast, only those that allow their falling nature to be conformed to the image of Christ will be sealed. You don't get sealed simply because you've said the sinner's prayer. Now, we also know that it is the people that are being measured, just to confirm it, because at the time of Ezekiel and Zechariah and John's vision of the temper being, being measured, there were no physical temples. They'd been destroyed. Now in chapter, in Revelation chapter 11, the temple was measured more accurately. The people are being considered to see if they measure up to God's standard. And God is doing this for two reasons. 
Firstly, he is about to bring judgment and punishment upon the earth for rebellion. And because he is a just God, he will first determine whether punishment is justified. And then secondly, he's looking for the new wineskins. So in Revelation 14, where humanity is divided between those who shall be saved from wrath, they will be sealed and, and protected, and those that shall go through the wrath, which is the second half of the tribulation period, when the bowls of wrath are poured out. Now the temple measurements are given again in Revelation 21. This time it is the new Jerusalem temple that is being measured, and again it, it is it's a people that is being assessed. God has taken his people through the fires of testing to see if they have the new wineskin. If successful, then they will be assigned the new name, that of the bride, the lamb's wife, New Jerusalem, the holy city. In the last video, I spoke about um, how God is going to give his people, his millennium people, a new name. So let's look at Revelations 21, verses 1 to 8. Now I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no more sea. Then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I saw a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they will be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. Then he who sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said to me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. And he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give the fountain of water of life freely to him who thirsts. He who overcomes, he who overcomes, shall inherit all things. And I will be his God, and he shall be my son. But the cowardly, the unbelieving, abominable, murderers, Sexually immoral, sexual, sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Now, this is where the interesting revelation comes in. Let's look at the measurements of New Jerusalem. If we're looking at a people. If the measurements reflect a people, if it gives us information about the people, then we need to have a look at it. Revelations 21, 9 to 13. Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls filled with the seven last plagues came to me and talked to me saying, Come, I will show you the bride, the lamb's wife. Okay, so we are about to see the lamb's wife. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me the great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God, having the glory of God. Her light was like a most precious stone, like a jasper stone, clear as crystal. Also, she had a great and high wall with 12 gates and 12 angels at the gates and names written on them which are the names of the 12 tribes of the children of Israel. Three gates on the east, three gates on the north, three gates on the south, and three gates on the west. Okay, so we can already see that New Jerusalem is not only the bride, but also the 12 tribes of Israel. Now, if we just go back to Revelation 7 for a minute and take a look at the 12 tribes. Okay, so that's verses 3 to 8. Do not harm the earth, the sea, or the trees till we have sealed the servants of God on their foreheads. Of all the tribes of the children of Israel were sealed, 
Of the tribe of Judah, 12,000 were sealed. Of the tribe of Reuben, 12,000 were sealed. Of the tribe of Gad, 12,000 were sealed. Of the tribe of Asher, 12,000 were sealed. Of the tribe of Nephtali, 12,000 were sealed. Of the tribe of Manasseh, 12,000 were sealed. Of the tribe of tribe of Simeon, 12,000 were sealed. Of the tribe of Levi, 12,000 were sealed. And of the tribe of Issachar, 12,000 were sealed. And of the tribe of Zubalon, 12,000 were sealed. Of the tribe of Joseph, 12,000 were sealed. And of the tribe of Benjamin, 12,000 were sealed. Now, this list of 12 tribes here is decidedly a New Testament type. It is not the Old Testament type and is unlike the Old Testament list. The New Testament list begins with the tribe of Judah, which is the tribe that Jesus came from. So whether we want it to be so or not, whether you are convinced that these are only Jews and they are Jews from the 12 tribes, the fact is that this is not a literal 12 tribes of Israel. This is a spiritual 12 tribes of Israel. Now, if we go back to Revelations 21 and pick up where we left off, so we're looking at verses 14 to 15. Now, the wall of the city had 12 foundations and on them were the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. And he who talked with me had a gold reed to measure the city, its gates and its walls. The gates which are in the wall and the wall and the wall are to be measured. Now, if New Jerusalem is the bride, then it's definitely saying here that it's people that are about to be measured, okay? Right, so verse 16, the city is laid out as a square. This is important. Its length is as great as its breadth. And he measured the city with the reed, 12,000 furlongs. Its length, its breadth, and its height are equal, which means it's not a square flat on the ground. It means it's a cube. The shape of the New Jerusalem is a cube. When Moses was given the plans for the tabernacle, it was to pattern God's heavenly temple. The Holy of Holies was an earthly type of the heavenly temple. These were the two places where God's glory resides, in the Holy of Holies and in New Jerusalem. Now, the Holy of Holies is a perfect cube shape. And I'm going to, once again, make an another video later on um, on the Holy of Holies and New Jerusalem and how they're connected, right? And, and about going through the veil, how Jesus went through the veil into the Holy of Holies, right? So back to this though, it's New Jerusalem, its length, its breadth and its height are equal. A cube has 12 lengths. No matter how you turn it, there are 12 edges on it. In verse 16, it tells us that each length or edge measures 12,000 furlongs. Each 12,000 furlongs represents the 12,000 sealed from each of the tribe of Israel. When we multiply 12,000 furlongs, by each of the 12 lengths, that is 12,000 by 12, we get 144,000. Now I'll put up some pictures, some diagrams, just to help with the visual of it, right? So that, this, this picture I'm putting up now, this is the measurements of the wall of New Jerusalem showing that each length is 12,000 and that there are 12 lengths. So 12 times 12,000 equals 144,000. So Revelation, if we move on to verse 17 now, it says, Then he measured its wall 144 cubits, according to the measure of a man, that is, of an angel. So the New Jerusalem is 144,000 by measurement of a man, of an angel. In other words, it's measured by the standard of created beings 
and not by the measurement of physical bricks and mortar. So some believe New Jerusalem to be a pyramid, but that gives only eight lengths. And there has to be 12 lengths to allow one length for each of the 12 tribes. Each tribe contributes 12,000 seal, which is represented here by furlongs. Now, the New Jerusalem is the bride of the Lamb. It says so quite clearly, twice it says it. And her walls are made up of the 144,000 sealed. Those are they that have laid down their lives for God, that have surrendered their all for him. Now, it says in, in back in uh, Revelation 7, immediately before it talks about Israel, it says, and I heard the number of those who were sealed, 144,000. So we know the 144,000 are sealed. We also know that the 144,000 is the bride. They are the same people group. Now, 144,000 is not a literal number. It's not a quantitative name. It is the name that God gives them. It's a pronoun. By calling them 144,000, God is identifying their purpose. He's identifying their mission. He is writing himself into their name, right? Because that's where he lives. He lives in New Jerusalem. And so he is giving them a new name. He is calling them after New Jerusalem. He is embedding, embedding himself in their name. So the number of the 144,000 is going to be many, many, many more than that. It is not going to be only 144,000. I don't know how many, but it's many. So in Revelations 12, 11, it says, Then I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ has come. For the accuser of our brethren who accused them before our God day and night has been cast down and they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony and they did not love their lives even unto death. So in the next video I'll, I'll be showing you how God showed me um, the timing of when the bride will emerge and, um, and we'll probably talk a bit more about what her ministry will be. Thanks for listening.